welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast. My name is Jesse Chappis, and I'm here with Marnie Wasserman. Today, we have a really special guest, Vani Hari, aka Food Babe, who is out looking out for the greater good of us all. She is digging into different foods and food companies and exposing hidden chemicals and ingredients that are causing detriment to our health. Vani has come face to face with companies such as Subway and has brought forth an ingredient that you'll find out later that was also found in a yoga mat. Pretty gross. She's also after companies such as Starbucks, Kraft, among so many others, and really just trying to shake the ground and get things changed for the greater good of people because it's all about the ingredients. And she really does have a passion to educate consumers on how to read labels better, how to make the choice of healthy packaged foods versus unhealthy packaged foods and watching the processed ingredients that we are consuming on a day-to-day basis. So it's very much in line with everything that Jesse and I are about and uh, just making better choices and choosing whole foods over processed foods. And Vani also gets into how the word natural is being used quite a bit on different packaging to try and convince us that certain foods are healthy. And we find out that it really doesn't hold a lot of weight behind it. So that's an important thing to consider. It's called health washing and companies are doing that to try and promote unhealthy products as healthy. And we're really excited to talk about Vani's new book, The Food Babe Way. This book is amazing. Marnie and I got pre-release copies and it talks about weight loss. It gives different healthy habits that you implement day after day to make changes in your healthy lifestyle. It's got different healthy recipes, and it's just a really comprehensive guide that fits really in line with Marnie and I's thoughts on healthy living and bettering your overall lifestyle and food choices. So be sure to head over to Amazon and check out The Food Babe Way. And check out our show notes at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. We're going to have links to everything there and a summary of today's show. Last week, we tried something really cool where we had you guys take pictures on Instagram of yourselves and where you're listening to our show. It was really cool to see and really cool to interact with you guys. So let's try that again this week. And our handles are at D-R-J-E-S-S-E-C-H-A-P-P-U-S and at M-A-R-N-I-W-A-S-S-E-R-M-A-N. So one thing I noticed afterwards is that if you guys have your settings set to private and then you tag or mention us in the comment under the picture, we don't get a notification and we won't be able to see it. So just keep that in mind that we can't see those pictures. And we look forward to connecting with you guys. Enjoy today's show with Vani Hari. Hello, Vani, and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. We're excited to have you on the show. You are doing some incredible things in the food industry, and we would love to talk about some of that today. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Great. Well, let's jump right into things. Tell us, Vani, how you got into the health world and how Food Babe got started. Sure. So, Um, You know, most of my life, um, I grew up like a typical American uh, on the standard American diet. You know, um, both my parents came from India uh, in the late 60s, and they really adopted the American culture. You know, they didn't really require my brother and I to eat the Indian food that my mom was cooking. They really let us follow what our neighbors were doing in in the kids at school. So, you know, we really took cues from the environment around us instead of really looking for nutritional information and for, you know, uh, home cooked foods at home. And so, um, when I wanted Burger King or McDonald's or Wendy's or what Chick-fil-A, you know, I got it as a child, you know, one of the first things my dad actually introduced my mom to was the hamburger. You know, he had been in the United States for several years before he went back to India to have an arranged marriage. And when they came here, you know, the first thing they, you know, he said to her was like, you know, you're going to eat hamburgers. And she, she never had, you know, beef in her entire life. You know, the the cow's sacred in India. So it was really new to her. And it, it was just really funny how my dad and my mom really wanted us to become Americanized. 
uh, it was funny. It took my mom not very long to realize that eating fast food and eating the American food wasn't making her feel well. So she actually went back to cooking an Indian food. And so every day when we would have uh, food growing up, we'd have two meals on the table. We'd have Indian food and then we'd also have, you know, the processed food version of American food because my mom really frankly didn't know how to cook American food. There was no, you know, handed down recipes from my grandmothers, etc. Those were all Indian recipes. And so, you know, she took the help from Betty Crocker and from whatever the grocery store could help her um, create. And, you know, we ate out a lot too. And as a result, now, now looking back and understanding where my journey has led me uh, with my health, I realized that the food that I was eating was making me sick. Uh, I used to have stomach issues, not wanting to go to school because of them. I was in and out of doctor's offices on several prescription drugs growing up, had eczema all over my skin and my face, had asthma, had very severe allergies. And then when I had a light bulb moment in my early 20s where I was working a really tough, demanding consulting job, traveling on the road, and I gained a lot of weight and then eventually had my appendix taken out. I had a a light bulb moment. You know, I was overweight. I was sick. I had an organ taken out of my body. I I looked terrible. I felt terrible. Uh, I was still taking all these prescription drugs. And I just decided that day in the hospital, recovering from that surgery, that I wanted to take my life back in my own hands. I wanted to research health. I wanted to find out how to lose the weight, number one, but also to feel really good. And I just, it was just that kind of, that moment, you don't really understand why it's happening at that moment, other than the fact that you're in a hospital room in December and everybody else is going to Christmas parties and holiday parties and all you want to do is go to the mall to buy a present for someone that you love and you can't because you can't sit up because there's a stitch down your side. And it was just, it just was a really depressing moment. And so I started to channel this energy and this knowledge that I had about how to research. Uh, In in high school, I had had become a top tier ranked debater, actually nationally ranked, recruited to the top debate colleges, actually to go to college. And uh, one year we learned uh, healthcare is a topic. It was uh, to resolve that the United States um, have a national health care policy. And uh, as a result of my research during that year where we debated affirmative and negative of the topic, I learned a lot about the healthcare industry, but I also learned how screwed up it was. And I was using that information to my advantage to win debate rounds, but I wasn't using that information for my own health or for my own individual needs. And so I started to like remember some of that information. And so that kind of just, you know, it was like this light bulb moment. I started, as soon as I got out of the hospital, I started researching like crazy. I started actually going into the library and, and checking out books. I remember one of the first books that I got was Spiritual Nutrition uh, by Gabriel Cousins. And, and just learning about what is the, you know, what are the most nutrition, you know, most nutritious foods on the planet? And then what are the most nutritious foods that I can put in my body that I like to eat? And how do I incorporate those on a, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner basis? And so that was like the first thing I did was try to add like healthy foods into my diet. I didn't like necessarily learn about food additives or, or the genetic modification of our food or uh, the fact that, you know, there's so many pesticides being sprayed on our food or, you know, any of these other topics that I'm writing about today, those slowly became uh, acknowledged throughout my, you know, 10 year journey. And even now I uncover things that I never thought existed in my daily investigations. So, you know, this has been a complete journey of learning how to eat and learning what's in my food. And when I started to make those healthy changes and started to drop the processed foods and realizing that the majority of processed foods in, in the grocery store were made out of one or two things, corn or soy, based on the subsidies that our government provides our farmers, I realized really quickly that that couldn't be healthy. I started to use my common sense and I said, you know, eating those two crops is the majority of your food. It's just not a healthy thing to do. And so I started to learn about omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids and the imbalance of that and why all of a sudden there's this huge 
influx of all these products that are fortified with this fatty acid, you know, omega-3s, like it was so important for brain health and Alzheimer's and depression and so many things. And, and I started just to put the pieces together and the puzzle pieces. And I started to become my own nutritionist in a way. And I became my own investigator, my own health investigator, I started to take control of my life. And as a result, I was able to go from a person who was always kind of chubby, not in shape, didn't feel well, not athletic really, and to a person who became uh, healthy. I've maintained my weight now for over 12 or 13 years now. And, and I went off every single one of my prescription drugs. I mean, I was on six to eight, depending upon the season. And the reason why I say six to eight is because, you know, I take six on non-allergy season and then eight on allergy season. So it's just a lot of drugs, especially them interacting with each other and you know, be, to be taken at that young age. And as you know, there's tons of side effects to drugs too. So, you know, just to think that I could have been continuing to take those drugs today just makes me sick, not to mention just pumping the money into the pharmaceutical industry, considering that food can really be medicine. Absolutely. And, food is and medicine. Yeah, 100%. definitely. And that was something that I learned. So Amazing. And yeah, doing the research and realizing, you know, the best research possible is applying it to your own body and seeing how well you feel. And when you're uncovering all this stuff that's going on behind the scenes, it's just, it's just amazing the, you know, the changes that you can make in your own personal life and also the changes that you have now made on, on a greater scale. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the Food Babe brand that you have now, as well as the Food Babe Army and how that kind of came to life out of all of this evolution of your own research? Well, you know, when I came up with, uh, actually it wasn't me, it was my husband who came up with the name Food Babe to call the blog. It wasn't the purpose of being a brand. So just you saying that actually kind of like gives me the willies because it's like, oh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't meant to do that. It was actually meant to be a cute, rememberable name of a blog so that I could make sure somebody was reading what I was writing. Um, you know, it it really was born out of my friends and my family and my coworkers kind of begging me to share this information that I had learned with them. And, um, and so that, so I started the blog for them really, you know, my dad had just gotten diagnosed with cancer and my mother-in-law had just died of cancer. And I realized that, you know, I didn't want to be like them. I wanted to do whatever I could to prevent those diseases and I wanted to live a really healthy, vibrant life. And to know that I have 10 times more energy now, 10 years later in life, is just a remarkable testament to what eating healthy can do. I, I wanted to make sure other people could feel as good as me. And, and so I started to just, you know, we, we registered the name foodbabe.com and I started blogging under that. And I was still working in the corporate world, still working as a consultant, working crazy hours. And I actually gave up television to have time to write this blog at night after work and on the weekends. And that's when I did most of my investigating was actually on the weekends. And I actually hid my identity for the first year and a half or so on the blog under the name Food Babe because I was just nervous about putting my name out there, Bonnie Hari. And actually, I was never on social media before I started the blog either because as a corporate citizen, as someone who works for big conglomerates, you don't really want your personal life out on the web and social media. And so it was really a huge uh you know, undertaking emotionally to, to like let go of all of those, you know, those stereotypes of like what it means to have a social media profile, to, to have that and continue working in the environment that I was working and then also do this like blog at night. And so I basically started blogging just about basic tips, you know, what I do when I travel, what I do uh, when I'm at home, what recipes I'm making, how I'm working out. And it turned actually into this activism blog by accident. It wasn't something that I set out to do. It wasn't like, you know what, I'm going to hold the food industry accountable for what happened to me. It wasn't like that. It was like I started to research even more when I started the blog and the things that I started to uncover really upset me. And the fact that no one was really talking about this. I mean, there was very little 
uh, movement on the blogosphere as far as activism work. I mean, there were some big sites doing it, but there weren't like everyday individuals like myself doing it. And I felt like I was really upset. And, you know, the first investigation that I did was actually into my local yogurt chain that said that they were, you know, serving organic yogurt. And when I looked in a little deeper into the ingredients, I found out that they were starting with organic milk, but then they were adding trans fats, artificial food dyes linked to hyperactivity in children and could be contaminated with carcinogens. And they also had GMOs in there as well as preservatives. And so it was really alarming that they were getting away with like advertising their yogurt is organic. And I wrote about that and it went so viral within the community of people, people's customers of that yogurt chain euphoria that the CEO reached out to me and not only did he yank some of the marketing down, but he started to post his ingredients online so that people can find out what's actually in them. And he met with me at at a conference um, a few months later and and we talked about what consumers want and the information they want about their food. And I felt very duped as well as everybody else uh, who had visited that yogurt chain thinking that they were eating something healthy. And so that was like my first, I'd say, real taste of activism. Um, you know, what it means to, to speak your mind and speak the truth and, and question what's happening around you and, and communicating that to the public and uh, basically getting a company to change its ways or improve its ways based on your writing. And so I said, well, wow, okay, I need to continue investigating things that I thought were to be true, but maybe aren't. And one of the next investigations I did was actually on Subway, um, Subway and Chick-fil-A where you know, both of those things have a very healthy um, marketing messages around them, eating fresh. You know, Chick-fil-A has that very holier-than-now kind of attitude about their food. You know, they're not open on Sunday, you know, all of those things. And, and I wanted to know if they're really selling, you know, healthy products. And what I found out is that they weren't. And the marketing that they were using was very false and misleading to the public. And I wanted people to know. Very important to bring some of that to light. And I definitely want you to mention uh, what you found in the subway investigation. So maybe, you know, maybe we'll do that now, but then I would like you to also kind of share, obviously you've had a lot of positive response from a lot of these companies. What's been the biggest resistance that you found from a company, either not sharing something or giving you you know, some kind of feedback that's been negative or whatever it's been. I'm just curious about what you've encountered. I'm sure you've had to go through a lot of red tape. So just maybe share a little bit about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for the first part, for Subway, you know, one of the things I found, and that is, I think, what the blog is really famous for, right? I mean, they just, this this petition in itself went absolutely crazy viral. But I had been writing actually about Subway for a few years, even um, filmed myself eating a yoga mat because of one of the ingredients that was contained within their Subway sandwich bread, which is called azodicarbonamide. It's a dough conditioner that's a plasticizer, uh, the same thing that makes those little uniform uh, bubbles in the side of a yoga mat. It's the same thing it does in bread. And what I found out is that this ingredient was not used in Subway sandwiches overseas, but in our bread only. And I was like, well, it must add some value or some, there's got to be some reason why we have it and other countries don't. And actually I found out that other countries ban the ingredient because there's so many health issues associated with it. The world health organization says that when you actually inhale this ingredient, you can have asthma So think about all the workers across America and all the bakeries that are creating this bread and they're being exposed to these toxic chemicals every day and they're putting it in bread. I mean, bread's supposed to be basic five ingredients, you know, uh, wheat, uh, honey, maybe salt, yeast and water. I mean, I can't imagine uh, what we do for our workers here in the United States who have to handle these ingredients every day, but also There was another study that was conducted that showed that when this ingredient was heated, uh, which most bread is heated, 
it turns into a carcinogen, and that's actually why certain countries uh, will fine you four hundred fifty thousand dollars or put you in prison for using this ingredient. And so, if Subway figured out how to make their bread without this ingredient for everyone else in the globe uh, and not us, even places like China. I felt like something needed to be done. And when Michelle Obama went on air and said that Subway sandwiches are healthy for all kids and, and parents should feel good about sending their kid, you know, feeding their kids Subway, I knew right then and there. I stopped everything I was doing. I was actually in the middle of writing my book that's coming out in February, stopped writing it and started focusing on this petition and filming a video and getting a petition up, site up live on foodbake.com so that I could petition them to get rid of this ingredient. And really, it wasn't so much about the ingredient, but it was much more about the fact that they were telling the American public that they were eating fresh. Meanwhile, when you look at the ingredients in their bread or even in their meat or other ingredients that they put on sandwiches, they're not fresh. You know, there's a lot of processed chemicals that go into a Subway sandwich. And I wanted people to finally start asking those questions. And as soon as that petition went crazy viral and was covered by every national and international media across the world, uh, people started to not only look at their bread ingredients at home, like their, their loaves of bread, but they started to ask questions about, well, what's in the meat at Subway? And they started to ask more questions. And this awakening started to occur about artificial ingredients in America's food. And that is what I am so the most proud of. It's not a specific campaign or anything. It's, it's the awakening that's happening uh, in America right now. And that I'm just a part of that. I helped, you know, spring uh, forward and, and just my little part here that I'm doing on my blog and, and spreading this information has been very, very rewarding to me. But to answer your other question about the pushback or some of the red tape that I've had to, to go through, you know, I th- I'd say like, you know, there's a couple companies that, you know, I think really need to be uh, exposed for what they're doing. And the first one is craft, craft foods. Um, is a staple uh, American brand. It's an international brand. And when I petition them to remove artificial food dyes, which they don't use in other countries, but they only use here and in Canada, I was uh, really stunned when I went to deliver 270,000 signatures to the doorstep and thousands of letters from parents who had removed artificial food dye from their children's diet and their kids actually improved at school or they got off their ADHD medication or they felt better or their eczema went away. So many issues that I I heard from parents all across the world. And when I dropped off those letters and those signatures, I expected them to say, yes, we're going to do it. We want to listen to the consumer. Instead, they treated me very coldly. And I actually tell the whole story. Actually, it's the beginning chapter. It's the introduction to my book about what happened in that meeting and how I felt. So you're going to have to read the book to find out. But, but another company that I feel like really needs to be exposed for what they're doing and their lack of transparency is Starbucks. You know, Starbucks uh, sells this very gourmet cup of coffee. You think you're paying more for it, so you're getting a higher quality. And in in all actuality, you're not. Um, You're getting the same type of ingredients that are being sold at Dunkin' Donuts and other uh, cheaper places to buy coffee, Tim Hortons, etc., and, and one of the things that they're not doing that the other competitors are doing is that they don't release their ingredients in their drinks online. Like, so if you're drinking a Frappuccino or a pumpkin spice latte or their new chestnut latte, you don't know what you're drinking because there's no way for you to find out that information very quickly. You have to call the customer service. You have to email the customer service. And then they give you a standard answer back, which they don't give you all the information. Then you have to keep begging them for the information. And finally, you might get it. They're using very potentially hazardous ingredients in their very famous coffee drinks like Caramel Color Level 4, which the center of science and public interest has fought to get removed from the food supply as well as 
uh, consumers union who is, uh, you know, uh, falls under the consumer reports that looks out for consumers. They see that there's some small cancer risk associated with consuming this ingredient. I don't think you need to color a coffee drink more brown with caramel coloring. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so knowing that Starbucks doesn't use this ingredient overseas, I know they can serve their products perfectly fine without it. And so I really wanted to petition them on this ingredient, but um, actually didn't have to because I wrote an article about what was in the pumpkin spice latte and it went absolutely crazy viral to the point where every national news media took a hold of it. And as a result, Starbucks confirmed that they have a team in place to remove caramel coloring from their drinks. And they also are considering putting their ingredients online for the first time in history. So, you know, I still like to see a lot of pressure on these companies until they actually do things. You have to remember, these are, you know, you know, if it was me and my company and I was Starbucks and I said I wanted to post my ingredients online, if I really wanted to do that, I can do it tomorrow. They're a multi-billion dollar company. And actually, you know, uh, if they just sent me a PDF of the ingredients, I'd put them up on foodbabe.com by tomorrow, probably by tonight. That's how fast things can happen. And so the fact that they're, you know, dragging their feet with this is just really interesting to see what they're trying to play here. If they're trying to clean up their ingredients, maybe they are, which is fantastic if they are. But I'm not sure what's taking a multi-billion dollar company so long to do something so legitimate and so much. It's, it's our, our right to know what we're consuming. And I'm, wa- I'm waiting for that. So Yeah, it's a scary situation when a company doesn't want to come forth with what's in their products. I mean, hopefully in the near future, companies will want to put up their ingredients online and be proud of these products they're creating. So that would be a real shift. Yeah, no, I would love to see the ingredient label on the front of packages in big, bold print. Here's what's in my food. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, some of these companies that are producing healthy packaged foods are proud of their simple, clean, organic ingredients. And uh, hopefully the shift will continue that way. Mm-hmm. So, Vani, I know you're big on non-GMO foods. You've called out a lot of companies such as Cashy, Nature Valley, a whole bunch of different companies that were putting GMOs in their products. It's really hard for the public because there's a lot of greenwashing and companies that are using clever branding to make their products seem healthy. So people think they're buying healthy foods for their families. And uh, how can we go about telling what companies are actually legit? Well, you know, it, it goes back to what we were just saying. You have to read the ingredient label. You actually have to read the ingredient label. You have to know, you have to be an ingredient label expert. And that's actually something that I teach in the Food Big Way, my book, is how do you spot the ingredients that could be genetically engineered? How do you spot the ingredients that could be hidden MSG? How do you spot the ingredients that sound, you know, healthy, sound natural, but really aren't? like, you know, a seaweed extract called carrageenan, you know, like, you know, is that something that's healthy? It came from seaweed, but it's really not, you know? And so it's really important for you to learn what ingredients are and and what they mean. And if you don't know what an ingredient means, or if you don't recognize an ingredient, put the product back down. I mean, that is one of the most fundamental things that I started doing when I started learning about ingredients in food, but you know, me being the inquisitive person that I am and the gumshoe that I am, instead of putting the product back down, I went and started to research that ingredient and be like, what do they use this for? How is it used in the food industry? Why are they putting it in my food? How much money does it cost to put it, put it in the food versus real food? You know, all of these questions started going through my head. And so that's what led to this investigative mentality into the food industry because what I realized was really shocking. I mean, I uncovered investigations and studies and, 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 you know, uh, leaked documents showing that companies like Kraft who were owned by the same company uh, as Philip Morris were sharing research on how to get our brains addicted to food, you know, sharing research on how to, put additives and drugs in our food so that we buy more of it, we crave it, we taste it, and we don't want anything else so that they make more profit. 
And that was very alarming to me. Someone who uh, you know, used to be overweight, that didn't feel good, to think that you know, I'm trusting uh, the food industry to provide food for me and my family, and they're using these dirty tricks. Um, it was really upsetting. You have to think, you know, they're spending billions of dollars on this research. How is a typical mom, how is a typical teenager, the typical person being able to survive up against that? The sugar, the salt, the fat, everything that they're adding to food. And so, you know, one of the things that I quickly realized, and this is actually in an op-ed that I wrote for the New York Times, was on the word natural. When a company uses the word natural, it is completely unregulated. It actually is a $40 billion industry, the word natural. Natural products is a $40 billion industry. That natural can virtually mean anything. I mean, for example, Crystal Light has the word natural lemonade on it. Natural, there's nothing natural about natural lemonade crystal light. It has artificial food dyes, artificial sweeteners, and actually uh, there's been uh, consumer groups that are consuming uh, craft because of that product. We, we see Kashi, you know, putting our, uh, genetically engineered ingredients and calling their products natural. We see Goldfish, uh, uh, Campbell Soup, who owns Pepperidge Farm, you know, putting natural on their label. And they got sued because they were putting genetically engineered ingredients. So there's, there's so many companies getting away with this right now, you know, making us think their products are natural when they're actually not. And so if you see the word natural on a package, unless it says USDA certified organic, I put it down. And, and if not, look at the ingredients and make sure. And one of the things that, you know, the word natural, you know, the definition of the word natural in my mind is really the definition of organic, something that isn't produced with synthetic pesticides, don't contain any artificial ingredients or artificial hormones or antibiotics. And, and that's really what I think of as natural, but, you know, that is a term that's definitely been abused by the food industry and a term that either needs to be abolished, uh, not used on food packaging, or it needs to have some tight regulations around. And I think the regulation needs to be the word organic, because that's really what natural is in, in many people's minds if, if they were to use their common sense. Absolutely. You know, just sifting through all the different kinds of labels out there is exhausting. And being a nutritionist myself and working with my clients, you know, there I have a book as well. So going through that chapter in my book, I had to be so careful because there's so many confusing labels out there and natural being definitely one of them. So thank you for clarifying that. And on that note, Vani, I just want to talk about some of those things that are out there, those products that are out there that are seemingly healthy, things like almond milk. And I know there's a few others maybe you can share, maybe give a few examples of things that people are buying without maybe any direct label that, you know, that they would know that it's GMO or not or natural or not. They just think it's healthy because it's talked about in the health world, but really it's, it's quite uh, detrimental to their health. Maybe you want to share a few of those? Yeah, sure. So, so one of the ones that comes to mind and, and, you know, you know, the heart of some of these CEOs and executives and people who create these products, I'm sure that they see some benefit in reducing the amount of meat that's being consumed in this world. Because I tell you, factory farming is, is, uh, causes so many different things. But there's been an onslaught of these uh, alternative meat products uh, made from soy protein isolate. And, and Beyond Meat is one of them, Boca Burgers, Morningstar. You've probably heard a lot about these veggie burgers. And, you know, when you think of the term veggie burger or, or veggie meat or something, you automatically assume healthy because it's made out of vegetables. But a lot of the times it's pure processed crap. I mean, they're using the worst oils, canola oil or corn oil or soy oil. A lot of times they're genetically engineered. Even if they're not genetically engineered, they're not the healthiest oils for, for you. They're using soy protein isolate or oils that have been ex extracted from hexane, which is a very carcinogenic substance. Um, this is something that the Cornucopia Institute has tried to uh, bring light of to show that when any anytime uh, a non-organic soy protein is isolated, the, the, the manufacturing process is they use this gas to do it. And then also those burgers really don't have a lot of nutrition. 
um, they're really processed. And, and if I if I were to want to eat less meat, or if I want to become vegan or vegetarian because of animal rights issues or because of health, it wouldn't be to eat those things. And I wouldn't put one of those types of products in my cart at the grocery store. Instead, I would stick to whole real foods, thinking like quinoa and lentils and beans. And, you know, there are some good products actually being developed out there. And, and there's, a, there's a couple brands, Sunshine Burgers and Hillary's Eat Well, that are using whole real ingredients to make up their veggie burgers and things like that. But they're, but they're not a lot. So you really have to go look. And they're usually in the freezer section and you look at the ingredients. But, but really, you know, stay away from the fake veggie products because they're very, very processed. All right. Thanks for those tips. And uh, sticking on the topic of food, there's so much controversy these days in the health world. What diet is best? There's a whole group of people doing paleo, raw food, vegan. I'm curious, what does your current diet look like? And has it changed a whole lot over the years? My diet actually hasn't changed much in the last few years. But uh, there was a time period where I went almost vegan. And the reason is, is because I was traveling on the road all the time and I realized I didn't have access to sustainable meat products or organic dairy. And so as a result, I actually taught myself how to eat vegan on the road how to, and still get enough nutrition and still feel really well. And in, in all actuality, that's one of the tips that I, that I talk about in my book about how to eat at any restaurant. Period. You know, whether you're at an Italian restaurant, whether you're at a Chinese restaurant, a Japanese restaurant, wherever you are, at a Mexican restaurant, at an Ethiopian restaurant, a Thai restaurant, I teach you the strategies on what to do in those situations. And I think um, my experience with traveling on the road and being exposed to so many different restaurants through my work, I was able to really develop the tips and understand and read the menus and try to figure out what the best way is to stick to a real food diet. So to describe my diet today and describe how I live my lifestyle, I just make sure every time I eat, I put some nutrition in it. There's no dead foods that I'm eating. You'll never see me eat a processed hamburger from McDonald's, for example. I would rather eat a pack of almonds that are playing at the, from the gas station or somewhere else if I'm really in a bind. Uh, you'll... You'll see me eat, you know, a lot of green vegetables, whether in the form of a green smoothie or green juice or salads or kale. Um, I probably have kale or some type of a dark leafy green uh, shard or collard or something like that almost every single day. And um, a lot of my diet principles, actually the 21 habits that allow me to live a real food lifestyle in this over-processed world and being exposed to so many traps by the food industry, I put into this book. So each day you're going to follow a new habit. And these are the habits that I follow. And I've followed for a long time that have actually allowed me to maintain my weight. And there's actually a whole chapter in the book. You mentioned all these different popular diets like raw, vegan, paleo, etc. There's a whole chapter in my book actually dedicated to that to show you no matter if you are vegan, paleo, you follow the Mediterranean diet or the low-carb diet or the low-fat diet or the low-calorie diet, if you don't learn these 21 habits and these 21 principles, you're going to have pitfalls. For example, if you're following the low-calorie diet, you're still going to be exposed to artificial food dyes, artificial sweeteners that make you eat more than you should, um, a lot of different chemicals, GMOs, etc. If you follow the raw vegan diet, you're going to be exposed to a lot of products that have agave nectar. You know, I don't think agave nectar is one of the healthiest forms of sugar to consume. Um, you're also, you could be exposed to pesticides too, unless you take a look and, and choose organic produce. If you follow the paleo diet, you could be exposed to carrageenan, which is came from seaweed. It's been around for centuries. A lot of paleo people have nut milks because they don't, they avoid dairy and if they're, unless they're making their nut milk themselves or picking a nut milk that doesn't have this, they're being exposed to synthetic vitamins in those packaged nut milks, probably the gar gum that's actually linked. And I was just reading out of a European cookbook that uh, gar gum is actually linked to eczema and skin rashes, which I had no idea. So if you experience those things and you want to experiment, try maybe eliminating that ingredient. 
But, you know, one of the things that's so fundamental to my lifestyle in my book is to, to take less risk with your diet. Eat the things you know are the most nutritious and, and, and don't be an experiment for the food industry. You know, all of the chemicals that have been approved for use by the FDA uh, either have been approved by the food companies themselves or haven't been through any review at all. When, the, when Congress gave FDA the authority of regulating food additives, there was about 800 food additives uh, in, in the food system. Now there's over 9,000. And actually the deputy commissioner of the FDA, Michael Taylor, has said that he doesn't even know how many food chemicals the American public or even the world is being exposed to from the American companies that they, you know, the food that they eat. And that is a big issue for me um, to know that nobody is, not only do they not know how many chemicals we're being exposed to, nobody's studying the cumulative effect of all these chemicals together in our body. But we do see an increase in every type of disease Western disease right now. And I feel like pulling back on the additives and, and, and going with real food is the safest thing to do right now. And actually, I tell you my own story of feeling bad, looking terrible, and being on so many prescription drugs and feeling the way I do now, looking the way I do now, and and not being on prescription drugs and, and feeling so, so good, I know that there is some magic to this, this magic to eating. And, you know, whether there's scientific proof or not, I know if people start eating less processed foods, they're going to feel better. hundred percent. And it sounds like the Food Babe way is extremely comprehensive. So, you know, it just sounds so uh, like you've got so much great information in there for no matter what people are eating. So that's great. Thank you. So why don't we talk about maybe a couple of things, because there is a distinction I like to make that not everything in a package is necessarily processed, right? Like we are, you know, being in uh, North America, we're definitely exposed to packaged products. So maybe you want to give a few ideas of some healthy packaged products that either you consume or that you would recommend for someone who is still going to eat a whole foods diet, but still something that's relatively clean because it's, you know, unrealistic unless people are growing all their food on a farm that, uh, you know, that they're going to not have to unwrap anything to get to something. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, if you go in my pantry right now, you won't see a lot of processed food, but you will see there are some staples in there that I, I buy that are, you know, are homemade, that uh, are, are processed, but there aren't uh, processed chemicals and they're not, they're all whole ingredients if you look at the ingredient label. And so some of those things include tomato sauce. There's this amazing biodynamic organic uh, tomato sauce that I buy from Yellow Barn. It is, you can eat it right out of a jar. It's absolutely insane. It's so good. And I, I don't like make my own tomato sauce that often anymore because I found this brand. I love it. And it's so good that there's no reason for me to waste the time um, to make it anymore. And it's so great. And it's in a glass jar. It's, it's fantastic. You'll see some chips. Um, that are in my in my cupboard because my husband's absolutely addicted to them. But you know, you won't see me buying the Doritos that are full of processed chemicals and MSG to make you eat more than you should and to trick your brain and all of these things. I'm going for late July chips that are you know whole ingredients that are organic. There's you know they're not made with synthetic pesticides. They don't have the controversial additives in them. And so I go for a late July chip instead of a you know a Lay's or Doritos. Same goes for like any sweet type items too. One of the things that I love to buy is dried fruit. You know, I, of course, I wish I had all the time in the world to dry my own fruit, but I don't. Um, I do have a dehydrator and I use it often, but I don't have time to always make everything. And so I love buying dried fruit, whether it's like dried prunes or, or plums or, you know, golden berries. Golden berries are a superfood that comes from South America and they're delicious. They're like nature's version of a sour patch kid. They're so, so good. And they're so packed with vitamin C. And so like, that's like my treat that I eat. You'll also see, you know, in my fridge and in my freezer, different processed foods like 
um, bread. You know, I don't make my own bread. I actually buy Ezekiel bread, which is a sprouted form of whole grains. They actually don't even use flour in that bread, and it's actually really great for you, and it has – it's actually complete protein. So I love – love that bread. It's in my freezer at all times. And I take a slice or two out whenever I need it. Um, but I don't eat bread every day either, which is one of the, one of the habits <laughs> in the book, uh, that you read about. But, um, but, uh, and then there, there are other things that I'll buy that, uh, on occasion to help me, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're running around, you know, you want pre-made things. And sometimes the grocery store, especially the natural and organic grocery stores have pre-made items that really work well um, for a fast paced lifestyle. And so sometimes I'll go for that kind of stuff. So those are the kind of things that I, you know, I'm trying to think off the top of my, I should go look at my pantry right now and tell you more, but, um, but I actually have my entire pantry list actually in the food babe way available. So you'll be able to see exactly what you need. Oh, that's great. Well, Vani, can you talk about some simple upgrades people can make in the kitchen? A big one I'm recommending to patients is switching out, say, using olive oil for for frying something in a pan and using coconut oil because it's more heat stable. Can you maybe give us a couple of other examples that uh, people can implement right away? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you mentioned oils, and I think this is really fundamental because we're being exposed to so much corn, soy, and canola oil every time we eat out. I mean, that's what restaurants buy. That's what they use because it's cheaper to use it. Even some of the healthiest restaurants that I've visited uh, in the world use those oils. So it's really important when you're cooking at home, you have control over the whole situation. So it's really important just to not buy those oils. Don't even stock them in your cabinet. Instead, like you said, go for the coconut oil if you're sautéing or having any type of heat. If you're making an, uh, a salad dressing, go for an olive oil or even a hemp oil. Hemp oil is fantastic. It's really super healthy. And and also, I love uh, grass-fed butter. I think grass-fed butter is really super healthy. It has a huge dose of omega-3 and CLA, which is really great for your brain. And um, and so I use butter on a lot of things, too, and ghee, um, organic 100% grass-fed ghee, which is a type of clarified butter that actually goes, uh, uh, people who are lactose intolerant or have an allergy to milk sometimes can, can actually uh, tolerate that even more. Um, so those are kind of like, those are my fats in the house that I have. That I, that I do. And I think uh, the other things that are really important to switch over other than oils are our carbohydrates. Um, we need to get rid of the white rice, the white flour, the processed brown rice flour, or I'm sorry, uh, rice flour, or the, the processed um, uh, gluten-free flours. I mean, I can't tell you how bad some of the gluten-free products are out there. I mean, they're absolutely horrific for your blood sugar and for your health. I mean, tapioca starch, all these different things that they're adding to gluten-free flours aren't very healthy. So if you go gluten-free, stick with almond flour, stick with buckwheat flour. Those are really great as substitutes as well as uh, oat flour. And there's some oat flours that are gluten-free. And so to really switch over your grains to be whole grains. So, you know, the whole grains that I have in my pantry you know, consists of quinoa. I've got wild rice, which is actually a seed. I have buckwheat. I have, oh, I just love this. I have these, um, I have this pasta called tolerant pasta. It's one ingredient, organic pasta and ingredient is lentils. It's organic pasta made out of lentils. And so you get like close to 30 grams of protein per serving, which is insane. Um, or serving and a half, something like that. I don't have the box in front of me, but and it keeps you so super full and it's packed with fiber as well. And you combine that with some great tomato sauce and some vegetables. And that is a meal, I tell you. And it's one of the fastest meals because I tell you that stuff cooks up in only eight to 10 minutes. It's fantastic. Um, so that's, those are like my favorite kind of grain type products. And I have a lot of beans in the, in the cupboard as well. But, you know, really switch over. Stop using the white flour. I mean, there's just no reason to really use it anymore. And I know there's healthy ways to to eat or healthier ways to eat white flour, like if you make a sourdough bread or something like that, it has a less effect on your blood sugar. But 
it's really about moderating that as much as possible. And I hate the word moderation. I never use it really. So it's really about just, you know, if you're in Paris and you want to eat a croissant, great, go, go do it. Because it's like you're in Paris and you live life once, you should totally do it. But don't be eating a croissant every single day. And also, you know, stick to the healthiest grains as possible when you're cooking at home. All right. Those are some great ideas. And Vani, what we're going to do now is switch gears and go into a rapid fire question round where we're going to throw you a handful of questions and you can just answer first thing that comes to mind. How's that sound? Fun. Okay. (laughs) All right. So Marnie's going to kick it off here. So when you hear the word health, who do you first think of? Oh, me. Is that weird? (laughs) No, no, that's good. Cool. (laughs) All right. What's your favorite snack on the go? Golden berries. I talked about those. Yeah. What's the last thing you do before going to sleep at night? Read always. What's your favorite hot drink? Green tea. A deep one. What is your biggest fear in life? (sighs) (laughs) The first thing that comes to mind. Oh, I think just not succeeding, you know, not succeeding. Okay. And last one, if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only bring one food with you, what would you bring? Oh, that's so easy. Kale. <laughs> nice. Good answer. I think th- that's the first time we've heard that one. Cool. So Vani, we've touched on your book a number of times throughout the interview, The Food Babe Way. Can you give us the lowdown on your book? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the book that I wish I had when I started to figure out how to live this lifestyle, how to live in this over-processed world, how to live with these food companies constantly tricking us into eating more and inventing new additives and really preventing us from living our healthiest lives. And I tell you, this book does not exist, and it only exists because I wrote it. It's because I really wanted this manual when I started living this way. It is like the A to Z on how to survive in the environment we have and how to survive in this food system we have. And not only does it give you the reasons why this is important, but it's going to give you the 21 habits day by day. Each day, you're going to develop a new habit. And then the second day, you're going to learn about another habit. And uh, you're going to remember the the habit from the first day. And I'm going to expect you to continue that. But you're going to learn a new habit every single day. And so by the end of that 21-day program, you're going to learn 21 new habits. And these are the habits that will change your life forever. These are the habits that have allowed me to maintain my weight, maintain, maintain my weight loss, rather, uh, without dieting, without having to go on the latest, you know, diet craze, paleo, raw, vegan, vegetarian, low fat, low calorie, um, or the 2020 diet, or the, you know, there's so many new diets. These are the habits that you have to instill in your life. And it allows you to live a life that's really magnificent too. It's not about deprivation. This you know, it's really funny because the way I write about food and the way I investigate, a lot of people are like, what does she eat? You know, does she eat anything? <laughs> she, she always tells us what not to eat. Well, this book is going to be the book on what to eat, you know, and how to eat. And, and it's going to include everything you would ever want to know on how to live this lifestyle. And I think one of my favorite chapters is all about eating out, you know, and, and how to survive that. And, And I think that's one of the biggest pitfalls we have is whenever we outsource our food to somebody else, we can really lose track very quickly. So how to navigate that is is one of my favorite chapters. Another favorite chapter is a chapter that actually uh, was inspired by my husband's love of beer. And it was just an investigation into the entire alcohol industry, wine and liquor included finding out exactly how wine is made and what they're putting in it and how to avoid it and how to pick the best wine. You know, we know alcohol is not that great for you um, and is not good for your liver. It's definitely not good for weight loss, but a lot of people don't realize that the 
liquor manufacturers and the alcohol manufacturers are not required to put ingredients on labels. So they've been using certain additives to create even more addiction. And so we should know about what we're consuming. And so this book is not only about the habits, but it's also about the transparency. You know, I investigate major restaurant chains I've never investigated before on the blog. I mean, this information is cutting edge in this book. It's, I'm really nervous about everyone reading it because it's going to be a lot of fun um, getting all the different reactions from people when they start to learn this information. Um, also, there's a 21-day um, meal plan at the back of the book, too, and a meal plan that's very flexible. And, and it's based on the guidelines of eating 15 meals that you control of your own a week. So that means that you know you can choose to eat five breakfasts, five lunches, and five dinners at home. So you have two breakfasts, two lunches, and two dinners to be flexible. Say your boss asks you for out for lunch, or a friend asks you for dinner, or you need to meet a coworker for breakfast. Well, you have that flexibility in this plan, and actually help you make those good decisions when you do decide to eat out through the tips in the book. This is the book that the food industry doesn't want anyone to read. And to quote uh, my dear friend and mentor who wrote the forward in this book, Dr. Mark Hyman, he said, he said, if everyone were to follow the food babe way, 21 day plan, the food industry as we know it would crumble and a new era of innovation and creativity would take place. That's great. So listeners, make sure and grab a copy of The Food Babe Way. We're going to have a link to that in the show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. And we're also going to have links to everything else we discussed on today's show. So, Vani, can you let us know what would you be able to leave the listeners with that they could take away right after this interview and implement to lead them towards ultimate health? You know, my motto uh, is don't let anybody ever tell you no. And what that means and how you can use that in your own life is basically don't let anybody ever tell you no to your own health. That means if somebody offers you something you don't want to eat, or if you're in a situation where you don't want to be, you have control of your life. And you need to always remember that because I tell you, your health is your number one priority. Take care of your body because it's the only place that you have to live in. Beautiful. What a great way to end things. So Vani, can you share with the audience where people can go to find out more about you? Yeah, absolutely. Come over to foodbabe.com and sign up for my email updates. I send out brand new investigations, new recipes, and new cutting edge health information uh, to my subscribers every week. And uh, this is a, you know, a personal letter from me to you. And um, I always want to keep it that way. Great. And listeners, head over to iTunes. Give us some love in the iTunes reviews. Please leave us a review and a rating if you haven't done so and help boost our show in the iTunes charts. And thank you, Vani. This has been amazing. Thank you for your time. And everybody, again, head out and get her new book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vani, for sharing all of your wonderful knowledge. And uh, we're excited to share the message for you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.